It's Friday, January 24th, 2011, and welcome to This Week in Linux News. There was quite a bit of Linux news this week, so let's go ahead and get started. To begin, let's talk about the Linux distributions that released or updated this week. One of them that I'm extremely excited about because I did used to do some work with them is Foresight Linux. They've got their 2.5 Alpha 1 available now. If you're not familiar with it, Foresight Linux is a project based around the Connery package management system, which is based off of RPath Linux. And basically it's a rolling release distribution that with a little bit of work can accept Debian and RPM packages and it allows rollback, so if you install something that breaks the system, you just do a rollback and everything goes back to being the way it was. I've tested it out in a virtual machine and it does appear to run very nicely, so hopefully I'll be doing a first impressions of that sometime in the next week. And speaking of first impressions, I got an email this week from a developer of a new Linux distro called Saline OS. Anthony Nordquist, the developer, has announced the release of version 1.0. This is based on Debian Stable, but it is receiving updates from the Backports repositories. It is available as a live DVD and does feature the XFCE desktop. Since Mr. Nordquist asked me if I would do a review of it, again, I will be looking at that in the very near future as well. Another distro I'm extremely excited to see the release of is Partis Linux 2011. I took a look at the alpha a couple of months back in a virtual machine, and it ran so well in the virtual machine that I actually wiped my laptop off. I was going to install Partis Linux even though it was an alpha. Now because it wasn't alpha, all the graphics drivers didn't work correctly, they say they've got that fixed at this point, so I might be wiping my laptop and trying that out here very soon. But if you're not familiar with Partis, even though we've talked about it in the past, it is the distro developed by the country of Turkey, specifically for their use, but it is available for the rest of the world, and you are completely welcome to try it out. It is a KDE-based distribution by default, and they use their own package management system that they've created in-house. In addition, Unity Linux version 2011 Alpha is now available. If you're not familiar with Unity Linux, it is a Mandriva Linux-based distribution, but it's just a core that's designed to be built on top of so you can have your own custom distribution that is specific to your needs. Some other distros like Chameleon OS have already been created on top of it, but the goal of Unity 2011 is to make things simpler to expand upon and easier to create your own distro. So I look forward to seeing how well that works and I look forward to seeing what distros come out of it. And the last distro to talk about is not exactly a Linux distro, but it showed up on DistroWatch, so I thought it'd be okay to talk about it. John Combs, a friend of mine and a member of my lug, has announced that GhostBSD version 2.0 beta is now available. GhostBSD is a free BSD based live CD featuring the GNOME desktop. Keep in mind it is only a live CD at this point, but it is very nice to see a live based CD where you can test out BSD on your system using GNOME. And for the KDE fans, if you are interested in trying out BSD and you haven't already, try out PCBSD. It is the KDE based version. Alright, let's move things along to some software updates. This week, XFCE version 4.8 released. With version 4.8, one of their biggest goals was to remove some of the older, outdated packages like Thunar, VFS, and HAL, and replace them with more up-to-date things like UDEV. In addition, though, they've added some new features, like the ability to browse remote shares using things like Samba and SFTP. They also completely rewrote the panel and improved their settings dialog boxes, along with a slew of other changes. If you've never tried out XFCE before and you are interested, keep an eye out for it. I'm sure there will be a PPA available very soon, if there isn't already. And speaking of releases, but not exactly releases, the GNOME 3 website is now officially available for viewing. You can find it at gnome3.org. It still shows that it's alpha software, but it is in the works. They've got several screenshots available, some information on what you can do with it, some questions and answers, and they left themselves a bit of room to grow with the website because it's not 100% complete yet. To be honest, as we get closer to the release of Unity for Ubuntu and to GNOME 3, I really look forward to trying out the final products just to see where we're going in the desktop space. And of course, this is a Linux show and we're talking about releases. Let's talk about the new version of the kernel that's on the way. Version 2.6.38 Release Candidate 1 is now available. This comes with two key features that Linus himself is a huge fan of. Of course, the first one being the 200 line patch that does wonders as we read about on Pharonix and we've talked about a few times before. Of course, it's been said several times before, the 200 line patch is sort of a gimmick. If you're doing a lot of really heavy stuff in the terminal, you'll definitely notice a difference. If you're doing a lot of graphical stuff, you probably won't notice it. But the other main feature is a new RCU read copy update based lookup that's supposed to improve kernel performance by 30 to 50% in some cases. So basically the key features of version 2638 appear to be performance, speed, holy crap the new kernel is going to be really really fast. 
I think they should include that in the release notes. Moving on to our next item, it's not quite a release yet, but it is definitely on the way. The developers of the OpenShot video editor have been teasing some new features that they're going to have in version 1.3.0, which should be coming very soon. Some of those features include the ability to add multiple clips to the timeline with one easy step, some improved features as far as transitions, being able to snap a little bit easier, smooth scaling now works a whole lot smoother than it ever has before, you can with one easy step rotate any clip in any direction, they've made it easier to take a whole directory full of images and make a slideshow or a flipbook or a stop motion animation of sorts, and harnessing the power of Blender that they've got on the back end, you can make magic sparkles and fairy dust of sorts. So it looks like OpenShot is shaping up to be an amazing video editor in the very near future. There's just one feature that it's still missing in my opinion, and that is audio waveform thumbnails. But if you don't depend upon that, OpenShot might be the best solution for you if you are interested in video editing. All right, let's move on to some Ubuntu-related news. System76 this week launched two new laptops on their website, both in the $1,200 to $1,300 range. Both come with Core i7 Intel processors. Both come with 1080p screens and about four gigs of RAM and really large hard drives. I do have to say the price point of these is a little bit high in my opinion, but considering it is a Linux-based retailer and they are putting some really decent specs in these, it might be worth the money. In addition, this week Canonical released the web-based version of their Ubuntu One store. You can go to one.ubuntu.com and access all of your files there. In addition, there is a web app for Chrome OS for Chrome Web Store, so you can very easily add that to your Chrome, Chromium, Chrome OS device, browser, whatever it is that you're using. I have to say it's extremely nice to see the Ubuntu One service taking that step one step closer to being a full replacement for Dropbox. All right, and on to the Android news, and let's start with the bad news. According to Foss Patent's blog, it seems that Google may have actually copied some Java code in their Android operating system. According to the blog, they say that 43 files were copied directly from Java into Android without changing a thing. As such, this may not bode well for the Google Oracle lawsuit, but we'll just have to see what happens in the coming weeks and months and possibly years because lawsuits can take forever. On a much brighter note, in Google's fourth quarter earnings call they had today, they confirmed what Andy Rubin said just last month, that they are activating 300,000 Android devices per day. For the math challenge, that's a little over 9 million per month, and uh, wow. <laughs> Moving on to other things though, and because I am a Motorola Droid X user, this was extremely interesting news to me. It looks like the Motorola Droid X is going to be going to China soon with a slightly faster processor. However, the processor is not a new one, it is the same one that's in the existing Droid X, but overclocked to 1.2 GHz. That leaves a lot of people wondering if Motorola is going to release a patch to speed up the existing Droid X devices. I certainly would not mind. And speaking of Motorola, they made the news quite a bit this week when their YouTube account manager apparently told someone that if they wanted to load custom ROMs onto their Motorola-based Android device, they should really be looking elsewhere. Motorola later posted on their Facebook page that these views were not the views of Motorola, that they're looking to work closer with developers and to try to be more open in the future. They also mentioned that they're looking to offer a bootloader that will allow developers to use their phones as a development platform, which hopefully for people with existing Motorola-based Android devices will be a good thing for custom ROMs. All right, let's talk about a couple of Android-based software updates that happened this week, two that I'm actually really excited about. Launcher Pro version 0.8.3 released, and it comes with new transition effects. You notice I'm looking down because when you look at my phone now, it's got little cool effects now. There are four different transitions available, scale, rotate, flip, and cube, and they all seem to perform decently in my experience. So if you haven't tried out Launcher Pro before, it might be worth giving it a shot. I've been using it since the day after I got my Droid X, and I am definitely a fan. In addition, if you have your Android device rooted, an app called ShootMe had an update this week and they added the ability to screencast from your Android device. I have used ShootMe before to take some screenshots from my phone. I tried it out as far as screencasting. It does about 10 frames per second, which is not wonderful, but if you're just wanting to show off something that's going on on your phone, maybe show off an app, it definitely works. I tried making a short video of Angry Birds and it, it did work for me. Well, that's about all I've got for you this week and looking at the timer, it seems that that's enough. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you have a wonderful weekend and I will talk to you in a couple of days.